It is good to be with you on this Sunday morning. My name is Monty, and uh, really excited that you're here. I'll tell you straight up, God is going to bless you in an amazing way today. He's got a word that it's already blew me away as I prepared for the message, and I know that God's going to do something supernatural in this place. We're in a series uh, right now called Alien, and we're, lear we're learning how we're supposed to be different than a, lot of, than, than a lot of the way the world lives. And uh, in, in light of that message and preparing us for today, I gotta ask a question. And you can, if you would, Matt, jot the answer down, maybe put it in your head or put it in your phone, because we'll go back to it. But I wanna ask you for you, and there's no right or wrong answer to this, this is your answer, but what is most important to you? Like, like if someone asked you, hey, what's most important in your life? Or what do you value the most, right? What's most important? What is the one thing that really matters to you? Write it down, put it in your noggin, whatever you got to do, because we're going to come back to it. But what you're going to be tempted to do right now, for some of you, because, you know, if you're writing it down and your neighbor might look at your paper, you're going to be tempted to write Jesus, because we all know that in church, Jesus is always the right answer, right? Especially, I mean, it's Jesus is most important to me. I worship Jesus in the morning and the night. Yeah, yeah, I get it, Bible boy, but let's just be honest, okay? Let's be honest. And if, and if that is your answer, that's great. Write it down. I'm just saying be honest with yourself in this question, because it's huge. Because it is huge. And I'll tell you, I'll be very vulnerable most of my life, like, God wouldn't make, he wouldn't be number one. He, I don't know if he'd make the top five. Like, if you were to ask me this question in high school or college, my answer wouldn't be God. My answer would be girls, okay? That's what's most important to me. I'm just being honest. That's where it was. I remember my senior year of high school, I had a buddy, speaking of girls, that wanted to set me up with a date for prom. You ever been set up by somebody? You ever had somebody want to set you up with somebody? That's a dangerous game, okay? That is a dangerous game because when they come at you and they're like telling you how great the person is, I mean, the more you tell me how great they are, the more I want to run the other way, right? Oh, gosh, girl, ladies, you've had this happen. Oh, he's a great guy. He's, oh, you're going to love him. He's a great guy. And you're thinking, if he's such a great guy, why is he single? Well, he's just picky. He's picky. He's got morals. He's got standards. Okay, well, you know, is he cute? Well, he's, he's funny. I mean, he's so funny. <laughs> Okay, so he's ugly. Okay, so um, does, he, does he have a job? Well, you know what? He's, he's, he's in between jobs right now. But he, he, potential, potential. Does he have a car? Yes, he has access to a car. Great. So he lives with his parents. Well, he lives in the basement, so technically it's his own place. Okay, stop. I mean, you don't want to get set up like that. Luckily, when I got set up for this prom date, it, it worked out okay. I mean, it was nice girl. It was weird because he's actually from Jody's hometown. And uh, so, but Jody, this was God just getting me closer to you and my destiny. So God is awesome. He's so good. But, but anyway, <laughs> back to what we're talking about. What's most important? Here, here's what I know. Whether you wrote it down or you filed it right here, whatever you put down. In fact, here, let me guess. Some of you, I'm just going to guess what you might have thought of or put down. Some of you, it was faith or it was God or Jesus, and that's awesome. For some of you, it's family. You wrote down family. You thought of your children. You thought of your spouse or whatever. Some of you, you thought of friends. Some of you, if you're honest, you probably thought of food, right? Food's not a bad thing. I value food, right? I love food. So um, that's, if, that, if that's your answer, that's awesome. That's not a bad thing. But here's how you know if your answer that you wrote down or that you filed is true. Or, or maybe, it's, maybe it's what you want to be important, but it's really not important. It's where you spend your time. Like, if you spend a lot of time on what you put down, then, then your answer is correct. Then you were honest with yourself. But the reality is, you, you go towards what's important to you, right? You, 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 fi you find the time to do what is important to you. And this is so key. This is so big for our message today because what we value will determine what we do. Honestly, what you value. And I'm not saying what you value is right or wrong. I'm just saying you need to know what you value. I'm so excited. I don't even think Pastor Casey mentioned it. He wasn't supposed to. If he did, he'll be in trouble. But in a couple of weeks, we're starting a new series uh, called Goals. I cannot wait for it because it's going to be centered on this. Uh, this is really a prequel to that series in two weeks. But here's what I believe. The most valuable commodity, the most valuable resource, let's say resource, that we have this side of heaven is our time. It ain't, it ain't your money. You can make more money. You can lose more money. You ain't going to make more time. And neither am I. And, the, and it seems like the older we get, the more we understand that. Time is huge. And this series, Alien, is, is showing me that we're to be different. People spend their time doing certain things, but we're, we're called to be different. And I think a lot of people, we've gotten off track and we don't even know it. We think we're chasing what's valuable to us, but if you look at our schedule or you look at our calendar, it says something else. I'll say it another way. I bet, no one, I bet nobody on, the, on your piece of paper or in your mind 
no one put down, my number one priority is to binge on Netflix for 30 hours straight a week. Like, that's my, I love that, right? Orange is the new black and Stranger Things and, you know, red is the new blue, whatever. That's not what you put down. If you did put that down, I mean, thank you for being honest. That's okay. I mean, but you probably didn't put that down. But yet, the average American spends 28 hours a week on t watching TV. Okay? Now, your average American isn't going to say, watching TV for 28 hours a week, that's what I love to do. That's what I'm called to do. That's what, I, that's what I value in life most. They're not going to say that. But yet, if you look at the calendar and you look at their schedule, it's not, it's not so much what we declare I'm finding out. It's what we demonstrate. That's really what's important to us. And, and I'm, I'm not saying that to make us feel guilty. I'm just telling you, I've gotten off track. I would tell people, this is what's important. But if you look at my schedule for the last week, that's your, your schedule. What you did that day doesn't reflect that. So I want to bring us back to center today. I want you to know what you value, whatever that is for you. And I want to show you what God says about how you can go after what you value. And what God says is even what you should value. Here's what I believe. In a fast-paced, chaotic, crazy world, we start to chase things that don't matter the most to us. And here's what I know about the devil. We have an enemy. His name's Satan. And here's what he wants. He, honestly, this might shock some of you, he could care less if you're bad. He could care less as long as you're busy. As long as you're busy doing the things that really don't matter at the end of the day, he's good. He's okay with that. In fact, it, that means he's doing his job. It's so key that we catch this. Our time is crucial. And the world is spending time doing things. But I think if we peel back the layers and look at what the world is doing and what God has called us to do, it's night and day. And God is going to show you that. Because we don't want normal. We don't want normal. Normal says we need, to, we, need to, we need to do more. We need to make more so we, can, so we can have more and then we can be more. That's not normal. Normal is exhausted and overwhelmed and stressed. Normal is pressures at work and, and chores at home and uh, uh, schedules and kids' activities and maintenance and repairs and everything. And that's just Tuesday, right? No, that's what normal is. But God has said, I want you to be different. I've called you to be set apart. This is huge. Think, I mean, think about this. We, we, we live in such a fast-paced world, so chaotic, so crazy. Frantic is normal. Busy is normal. This is normal. So when you meet somebody who's not that way, I mean, they're just all calm, and they're relaxed, and they're successful, but yet they're not rushed. They're not, they don't seem like they're frazzled. Uh, I, I mean, when I meet somebody like that, you know, honestly, my first thought is, you just smoked a bowl, didn't you? I mean, that's my first thought, because I, that's not normal. That is not normal. But, but God says... God says, Monty, why do you say things like that is what he says. But no, but I'm just saying that's not normal. So we're going to look at a man today, a man you may have heard of or maybe had, haven't heard of. His name is Jesus. Jesus, okay, we can all agree on something. Jesus had, was, had a busy life. Jesus had a busy schedule. Like he had a, Can we agree Jesus had a lot to get done? If you don't know this, Jesus came on the scene as a baby we, we, we hear a lot about that, and then, and then we hear a little snippet of Jesus at 12 years old in Luke, just a little snippet. Then we don't hear anything from Jesus until he's 30 years old. Nothing. Like, like nothing. So I'm going to ask Jesus, what didn't you want us to know about your teenage years that you didn't put in the Bible? But anyway, that's a whole other story. I'm just saying, I am just saying that Jesus' ministry was three years. From 30 to 33 is when he did his main ministry, and he accomplished more than we'll, we'll ever accomplish. Agreed? I mean, we agree on that? So if Jesus, who had the busiest schedule you could ever have, found, found, found the time to do everything that was important to him, everything that was important to his father, yet he still had time to go away. The Bible has multiple um, scriptures where Jesus goes away, and he spends time alone with the father. He goes up the hill, and he prays. How did he do that? Like Jesus, there's no record of Jesus running around crazy. No record of him running anywhere. He's not rushed. He's not frantic. There's no record of Jesus waking up on Wednesday and he's got to walk on water later, but in the morning he's running around searching for his Birkenstocks. There's not, you don't see that. You don't see that. Probably because Jesus didn't have a dog, you know? If he had a dog, he'd be looking for those shoes. I have a dog and I'm missing shoes, a lot of them. So I'm just saying Jesus was never frantic. Jesus was never crazy busy, but yet he accomplished more than anybody. I want to look at the life of Jesus, and I want to share a story with you, a story that I think is going to be really impactful. If you brought a Bible, or you've got a mobile app with the Bible app, go to Luke 10. Luke is a, or a, a gospel, it's called. Gospel literally means good news, and there's four of them in the Bible. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the reason they're good news is because they all tell the story of a man named Jesus. And Luke tells a story of Jesus going to visit some friends. See, Jesus, he had friends. I mean, personal friends that they didn't ask anything from him. I mean, they just loved him and he loved them. And it was incredible. So Luke 10, verse 38. And we're gonna, we'll put it up on the screen here too. And you, you can read it along. What I want to do is this. I want to read it in full context to you. And then we're going to pull it apart. This is amazing. It's so countercultural the way Jesus was. Let me read to you. It says this. It says, as Jesus... And the disciples continued their way to Jerusalem. They came to a certain village where a woman named Martha, say Martha, Martha, welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary, don't leave Mary out, say Mary, Mary taught, or excuse me, sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, Doesn't it seem unfair that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come help me, she says. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you're worried and upset over all these details. But there's only one thing worth being concerned about. And Mary, she's discovered it. And it will not be taken from her. Turn to two people, if you wouldn't give them the title of today's message. Tell them the most important thing. Say, the most important thing. Tell two people, the most important thing. See, Mary knew what was most important. And and, and it was amazing. So let's pull it apart. I want to go back to the first verse I read. As Jesus and the disciples continued their way on Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed them. Now, right away, we've heard the whole story, so we can say, gosh, Martha, you're running around going crazy, and Mary's doing things all right. But we got to cut Martha a little bit of slack. Right? She's only hosting the king of king and lord of lords in her home. Right? It's the son of God in the flesh coming over. I mean, she's got a sheep casserole in the oven and she wants it just right for Jesus. So she's got a lot going on. And something I know about a lot of ladies in particular, some guys maybe, but a lot of ladies, when you're having a guest over, you want things clean. Right, Jody? You want things, Jody's like, "Mm mm-hmm. See, this is why I can never invite you to my house, because I'll be cleaning for three days just to have you over. That ain't happening, right? I do. So, um, actually, that's not true. So, but uh, Mary, or Martha wanted it perfect. Martha wanted it nice. Martha wanted it clean. And that's what she wanted. It wasn't a bad thing, but Jesus said it just wasn't the most important thing. Let's go to the next verse, 39. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening, say listening, to what he taught. This is key. Mary was listening. She was listening. This is, a, this is a whole other topic I'll talk about in an upcoming series as well about listening. Because we live in a world of busyness where people don't listen, hardly at all. We're, we're so busy talking. We're so busy tweeting. We're going to share our opinion. And you need to know what I think. And we don't take time to sit back and sit at the feet of the Lord and listen. And Mary listens. And, I, and I'll be honest, I struggle as a guy in this area, Right? One of these times, Jody's going to grab the mic and just tell you the story. I'll just tell you. So we, like, I multitask. Or I think I'm multitasking. Um, so I, I listen a lot to leadership stuff, and I'll put an earbud in this ear. But I'll leave this ear open because Jody's going to recap the day, and I get that. And she wants to tell me what her, how her day was. And this is how our night kind of goes. So I'll do that, and I'll be hearing her. But, but God is teaching me that hearing isn't the same as listening. Did you know that, guys? Like, I I didn't know that. So Jody let me know that hearing isn't the same as listening. So I'll have the earbud listening to my my leadership podcast in one ear. And then Jody's, you know, telling me about the day. And she's like, you know, and I think I'm listening. And she's like, you know, I got to work late tomorrow, honey. Um, You know, big day tomorrow at work. I'll be working late. And Ava, our daughter, she's got a, Ava's, she's telling me that Ava's nervous about a math test that she has coming up. And and then she says, I need to pick up paper towels tomorrow at the store and all this. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, you know, guys, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And pretty soon she's like, are you listening? And I'm like, yes, yes, sweetie, yes, of course I'm listening. And then she asked the question that freaks every guy in the world out. Scariest question you'll ever get asked. You know what it is? What did I just say? I mean, oh my gosh, crap. You immediately go into survival mode. It's like, oh, yes, I've got, I got this. God, I've got this. Jody, if I heard you correctly, um, you work tomorrow. You work tomorrow. You do work tomorrow. Yes. You work tomorrow and you are, you are nervous about working tomorrow. You're nervous about it, Jody, because Ava, Ava, 
You're nervous about working tomorrow because Ava needs toilet paper for a science test. Nailed it, right? <laughs> Nailed it. Didn't nail it. But this is, this is the way that I listen. And I need to get better. But God is, but Mary, listen. Mary took time to listen. I'm going to tell you something. You take time to listen. You, I'll say it a different way. Wherever you're at, be all there. Okay, when I do that, when I listen to this and this ear, and I'm pretending like I hear Jody in this ear, that's not being all there. Wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, just be all in where you're at. That's listening. That's true listening. We think we're multitasking. We're just kind of just not doing much of anything because we're not all in or all where we're at. But, but I want to encourage you to listen, not just to your family, not just to your kids or your wife or your husband, but, but to God. We're so busy talking. If we do pray, we talk and tell God what we want. Listen to God when you pray. You'd be amazed. When you read the word, if you're reading the word, I always say 10 minutes a day in God's word for the rest of your days will change your days. You read God's word. When you open God's word, God will open his mouth. That's what will happen. And when you listen to God and you do what he says, I promise you, your life will change. It will change. So, but, but you got to open the word and then you got to listen. And it's, it's, a, it's countercultural. Wherever you're at, be all there. Listen. Let's go back to verse 40. Martha was distracted, that's what busyness will do, by a big dinner she's preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, it doesn't seem fair or it seems unfair that my sister just sits while I work. That's not fair. Tell her. Tell her, Jesus, to come help me. Now, if you're, if you're a sibling or you got brothers and sisters or you got kids, I don't even have to elaborate on that much because we've heard that. Haven't you heard that? I mean, I love Jake, our youngest son, but my gosh, that kid needs help with everything when it comes to work. Now, if it's something he likes, he'll just go off and do it. But the other day, it's funny. I said, Jake, he wanted to go play with his friends. I said, Jake, just if you could, before you go play with your friends, he's like, oh, he's already saying, what, dad? I said, can you just pick up the living room? Oh, <laughs> I mean, I'm, this is just a little dramatic at our house, but he's laying there rolling around. <laughs> bawling for 10 minutes. I'm like, Jake, you could have been done by now. And he's rolling around, and then he says it, can Ava help me? And I'm like, Jake, Ava can't help you. She's at school. She's at an activity for two hours. He's like, I'll wait. I'll wait. I'm like, you're not waiting. Get to work. But I mean, it is hilarious. This is, this is my life. This is, I, I bet you can relate. But, that's, but she's like, can he help? Or can she help? She wanted help. But then Jesus countercultural that he was. This is what Jesus said. The Lord said to her, my dear Martha, I love that. He's, Jesus isn't mad. Jesus is loving. Jesus, he's not mad at Martha. Martha, you're such a screw up. You're always doing this and that. And you're never focused. He didn't say that. He says, my dear Martha, he says, you're worried and you're upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary's discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Question, what Martha was doing, was it bad? No. My gosh, she's preparing a beautiful meal. She's probably cleaning the entire house. She's doing all these things. Why? Because she has the king of kings coming to her house, and she wants everything to be excellent. She wants an excellent environment. She wants an excellent meal because he's an excellent God. That's not bad. In fact, that's good. But if God is teaching us something today, it's this. God is calling us today to say no to the good things so we can say yes to the great things. Okay? God is calling you to say no. We say yes way too much. Way, way, way too much. We're, we feel like, oh, we're going to miss out. Got to say yes. No, you don't. Start saying no to good things. Martha, how many times are you going to have Jesus in your home teaching and loving? Soak it in, he says. Say yes to the great things. But we're tempted to say, well, I need to do it. I got to do it because it's all important and it's all great. No, it's not. No, it's not. This is why you have to know what you value. See, if everything is important, nothing is. Okay? Does that make sense? If you say, well, it's all important, then nothing's important. Because it, it, that doesn't make sense. You have to have this value system of what you value. That's why we ask the question. Martha, she knew she was busy and that was good, but she didn't know what was most important and Jesus was teaching her. Know what you value. If you're here today and you say, I'm a follower of Jesus, 
By the way, if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus or you don't believe in Jesus, thank you so much for being here today. I'll tell you that straight up. I love the fact that you came in. I love the fact that you're willing to be open to that. Thank you so much. I pray God does something supernatural in your life in this moment. But if you are, you say, you know, I'm a Christian. That means Christ follower. If you're that, well, then he would be, your, your, your time and your value would back that up. But, but, on, but think about your day and think about your week. Like if you spend way more time in Facebook than you do in his book, then what you're declaring is different than what you're demonstrating. Okay? That, and I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I've been guilty of that myself, so certainly I'm not putting myself on a pedestal. I'm just saying we got to look at where we're at. we got to look at what's going on. But as I say that, I will tell you this. I'm super proud of you. I'm going to say it again. I'm super proud of every one of you in this place because you've chosen You've chosen what I believe is the, is the greatest thing. You've chosen to start your week, your Sunday morning, in God's house. That's what you've chosen. You've made a statement, whether you came here on your own or someone drug you here, you're still here. You're still here. So you've chosen the greatest thing. And I will tell you, it will not be taken from you. If you start your week every week in God's house, and I, I know, well, you're the pastor, you're supposed to say that. I'll, I'll tell you straight up, I'm not saying that because I'm your pastor. I'm saying that because my life was literally transformed by Jesus Christ in the church. And if he can do what he did in me, he wants to do something even greater in you. And I believe that. So I'm proud of you for being here. Because when you come here, here's what you're going to experience. You're going to get focus for your week in here today, I promise you. It's going to set the tone. You're going to get encouragement in this place. You're going to find meaning. You're going to find purpose. You're going to get blessings. You will find faith. You will find hope. You will find love. You're going to find all those things in God's church. And at the end of the day, guess what? You're going to hear truth. And my Bible says, when you know the truth, it's the truth that will set you free. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. So, I'm proud of you. Of all the things that you could do on a Sunday morning, you're here. You've chosen wisely, is what Jesus, I believe, would tell you. That excites me. Alien. Say alien. Aliens say no to good things so they can say yes to great things. That's what they do. They're different. They're set apart. There's two ways I'm going to give you, two practical ways today, that you can either take notes on or jot down or put in your phone. But I want to give you practicality of how you can live this message out. The first thing I believe we need to do if we're going to say yes to great things, replace and with or. Replace and with or. Okay? Stop saying, I need to do this, and I should do this, and I'm going to do this. Replace and with or. Stop saying, I should. I should. And I should do this, and I should do that, and I should do this, and I should do that, I should, I should, I should. You end up just shooting all over the place. Okay. Shooting all over the place. That's not even a word. So you know what I'm saying. Shooting, shooting. You know what I mean. Um, let me give you an example of and versus or. In my household, we don't get it all right. I, you, you, already, you probably already picked that up by now. But something that we do with our kids is we, we don't say and to sporting activities. It's or. So they're ne my, our kids are never in more than one at the same time. Because my gosh, one drives me crazy enough to get them to where they need to be. How can you do more? I don't even get it. But we don't do that. So we've, we've, set, we've set that up a long time ago. And selfishly, it's been great. Because it's, it, it makes, we have to make a decision. My son Jake is in fifth grade. He wrestled in second grade. Now, I grew up wrestling, so I was kind of excited when Jake wanted to wrestle in second grade. But what I found out is this. Wrestling on the mat is different than being a parent watching your kid wrestle. Oh my gosh, I've never, been so, I've never been so stressed in my life watching my kid out there getting beat up by another second grader. I, I mean, I've never wanted to beat up a seven-year-old so bad in my life. It's not good. That's just not good for church business when that happens. So um, it was so stressful. There was one time Jake was wrestling, and I'm like telling Jake what to do because the parents can kind of coach. But you stand off here, and the mat's over there, and I'm like, Jake, you need to stand up. You need to peel the hands. You need to clear the arm. You need to pick the ankle. And I'm telling him all this stuff, and I'm getting all intense like I can do sometimes. And all of a sudden, the ref looks at me and stops. He stops the match. And he says, hold on. I'm like, what? What's going on? He says, sir, you, you can't be out on the mat. And I was out on the mat right, right next to them. Didn't even know it. Didn't even know. I, I was supposed to be 20 feet back. I was walking out there as I was talking. And I'm sure all the parents are like, who is the psycho? Oh, he's the pastor. Um, so, yeah. But what, so what we did is we, we start. So, I, so the next year, I, I selfishly didn't want Jake in wrestling. I didn't because it, so, it was killing me. So I'm like, Jake, you got to pick wrestling or football. Okay, you got to pick one. And he loved football. 
but he loved wrestling. So I encouraged him. I'm like, ah, let's do football. Let's do football. You know, let's do football. So he did football, the third grade and fourth grade. And then we get to fifth grade. Now we live in the Omaha area and we love it. And uh, he keeps bringing up wrestling. And I'm like, okay, I can't keep denying the kid. If he wants to wrestle and torture his father, let's do it. And uh, so, so, and I kind of screwed up this year because I didn't sign him up for flag football in time. So then, well, yeah, real smart, right? So we had no other option. And he's like, dad, wrestling. And I was hoping that I missed the deadline on wrestling, but I didn't. So I signed him up this year for wrestling. So he's in wrestling now. But it's easier because they're in a program where they work their way up, and then once they get good enough, then they put them in tournaments. Oh, that's a novel idea. That was awesome. So I'm like, okay, Jake, you're just going to practice and do your thing, and he's good with that. And I'm like, okay, that's not stressful because I get stressed out when it's tournament time. And, uh, but here's what happened. After his first practice a couple weeks ago, and I already looked up the tournament schedule, we get in the car, and I said, Jake, I was, you know, I was there. I said, practice was fun. He goes, yeah, I love it. He goes, yeah, but I want to be in the tournaments. And I'm like, oh, God. I don't want that. But I, I looked, and the tournaments are on Sunday. And, I, and I, so, I, so I told Jake, I said, Jake, uh, the tournaments are on Sunday. And you know what he said? He goes, oh. And the reason he said, oh, is because he knew right there, that means that we wouldn't do tournaments. He knows automatically that because we, say, we don't say and to everything, we won't do tournaments. And he knew it. He didn't fight it because this has been a value of ours for a while. Again, the Gannons don't get a lot right, but we, we hopefully set the, the Sunday aside for worship and hanging out as family and rest. And I don't want to run my kid to some tournament on a Sunday. So I just, I, we, you have to know what's valuable to you. And so is he disappointed? Yeah, but not too much because he already knew. He's like, oh, Sunday, not an option. It's like he didn't even fight me hardly. He's like, not an option. That's not what we do in our household. I mean, how, I want him to know that that's not, it's just, it's just not that important. I mean, and selfishly, I don't have to watch the tournaments then. So, I mean, it's a win-win, right? So, um, again, I'm just I'm trying to be a better dad. So, uh, but that, I just want you to think about yourself. What are you saying and to? And what could you say, instead of and, say or to? If you say and to all the good things, you'll never say or to the great things. Okay, that's the first. The, the second thing is this. I'm convinced we need to replace the urgent with the important. Okay. It's not, it, the urgent's going to happen every day. Things are going to come up in your life. Life is going to happen. Bad stuff's going to happen. People are going to cut you off. People are going to be rude. Those things are going to happen. You can decide how you respond to those. But if you have things in your life that are scheduled, that are important, it's going to automatically block out the things that are urgent. This is huge. Again, Mary and Martha, the, m m urgent, urgent. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. But the important, sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to Jesus, learning from Jesus. Replace the urgent with important. This is a big deal and something I'm still trying to get right. But what I've had to do and what I encourage you to do, and I'm still getting better at this, scheduling. I'll say it again. Schedule it in your phone. Schedule it in your calendar. Schedule what's important to you. If it's binging on Netflix, fine. Schedule it. That way you don't miss it. I'm just saying, I'm not being serious. Schedule what's important to you because life's going to happen. And if you just respond to everything that happens throughout your day, you'll never live your God-given purpose. You never will. You might feel like you're doing some good things, but is, is that what you're created for? I thought God created you for greater things. That's what my Bible says, that you're created for something greater. This is what God has for you. This is why I'm so excited, but you've got to start scheduling it. This is one of my weakest areas. But I'm trying to get better. I'm trying to get better because at the end of the day, and you've had this happen in your life, where you've asked somebody to do something, or somebody's made a commitment to you, and then they backed out, or somebody said they would, would help you move, and then all of a sudden they disappeared off the face of the earth. Um, you get it. And they say, well, I just didn't have the time. I didn't have the time. Well, he, you know what I would say? You do have the time. You actually have the time to do everything that God's called you to do. That's how good God is. You actually will always find the time to do the things that are important to you. Always, you will. You always will. You always will find the time to do the things that are important to you. Schedule your, schedule your life. Schedule what's important. Make it non-negotiable. Ask yourself this question. Is it wise? Is the next opportunity that is put before me, whether it's a kid's activity or a startup business, or just, just making the next appointment. Is it wise? Is it something I should say and to or or to? Is it, the, I think the older we get, the more we're going to get it, probably. That every day is a gift, right? You start to understand every minute is a gift. 
And I put down, I wrote this down. I said, we need to ask ourselves whether it's wise to invest our time in the latest demand. Is it wise? Is it, is, is it wise to focus on the past and, 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 and dwell on it? No, it's history. Is it wise to be so flustered and worry about what's going to happen tomorrow at work or at school or whatever? No, it's a mystery. Is it wise to focus today? Yes, it's a gift. That's why they call it the present. It is a gift from God. And it seems like when something's happening in your life, you start to realize it more and more. And sometimes, unfortunately, it's a tragedy. You know, remember that, that, that senior prom date I had, Jody's classmate? Well, we, you know, it's not like we were dating. We just went to prom together and stuff, so it wasn't a boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. And she went to college, I went to college, but, you know, still friends. And I had a mutual friend that went to college with me, and one day she knocked on my dorm room on a Saturday morning. And uh, she, I opened the door, and she told me that the girl that I took to prom uh, died that night. So she was driving her car from, um, from uh, college back home and fell asleep, driving late at night, totaled her car. And I remember thinking, you know, we didn't, it's not like we were best friends, but I mean, that's still somebody that you, that you knew. And I, it's just always, I mean, and you've all had stuff like that in your life. You've all, maybe not that exact thing, but you've had things that have taken you aback, and you're like, dang, I didn't see that coming. I didn't expect that. And God starts to do something in you, and you start to realize tomorrow isn't a guarantee. Tomorrow's a gift if I get there. Tomorrow's a gift if God blesses me with that gift. I know, I know what he's blessed me with today, and I'm standing in it. That's all I know. As I prepared for you, and I pre pre prepared for this message, I read a story of a guy that worked up the corporate ladder, worked, 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 worked. wasn't a bad dad, wasn't a bad husband, but he neglected, he, didn't, he, he chose good over great. Let's just say it that way. Because you can get so enamored with climbing the corporate ladder and chasing the things that ultimately don't make a huge difference that we become seduced, right? It's like this, that's what this whole message is about. And he realized that his daughter was 16 years old and I don't know what happened, but something happened. And he realized something hit him and he said, I've got two years left. Two years. Two years. The days are long, but the years are short. Did you know that? The days are long, but the years are short. Two years. So he did the math and the calculations, how many weekends that is. And he bought a jar and put marbles in it. And every Monday morning, he'd take out a marble, chuck it, and it'd be a visual reminder of what he has left if he's granted that. Those marbles are no guarantee. That's if everything goes great, everything goes well, and we live all this great, you know, I no guarantee. So I hear that and I think, okay, my daughter's 13. So I've got some more time. And I did the math this week. I pulled a calculator out. And I, you don't know maybe a lot of my story, but I've wasted a lot of life when my kids were younger in a drug addiction that I couldn't beat. Miserable. Bondage, slavery. Anybody going through addiction, anybody going through any kind of bondage like that, man, there's hope. I'll tell you that. There's hope. We serve a great God. And I've wasted a lot of years in my marriage and in my fatherhood. And I thought, I think I'm going to buy a jar this week. And I think I'm going to put 286 marbles in that jar. And I'm going to start just taking one out every week as a visual reminder for what I have left. And maybe God will put it on your heart to do something similar. I don't know what he'll do. I just know this. And this is personal for me probably, but Martha, she spent so much time doing things for God that she missed spending time with God. And as a pastor and a church plant, that's pretty simple to do. You can think I'm doing a lot of good things for God and we're making a lot of difference. But all of a sudden, if you, if you peel back the layers and look at it, man, am I even spending time with him? Or am I just so busy doing things for him? Like he needs me. It's not gonna make it without me. No, he's God. He can do what, everything he wants to do. And it's his church. And I don't know how that's going to relate to your life. I hope it does in some way. But I want us to recenter on what's really important and how we're spending our time. And here's what I believe for me. I'll, I'll share me. And I think this is going to be true for a lot of you. Fear is a big deal. We fear that, like, I fear I'm not going to be enough. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to deliver it good, or I'm not going to lead well, or I'm not going to love enough, and I'm not going to do this, you know, and, 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 and their fear creeps in, and God has to say, you know what, I'm God. it's my church, it's my people, just relax, right, 
Martha, just relax. And I don't know what it is for you if it's fear of like we're going to miss out. Like in the world that we live in, we think I'm going to miss out. So many things happening, so many new opportunities. If I don't capture every new opportunity, I'm going to miss out. If I don't, if I don't do the next greatest thing, I'm going to miss out. And fear, and I put we're going to be afraid. Afraid we're going to miss out on the one thing that turns out to be the, the, the very thing that will finally fill the void that we so deeply feel. But if God is teaching us anything in this, in this series called Alien, it's this. Nothing that this world offers will ever fulfill you. Only Jesus Christ, the sinless, spotless Son of God, can fill your deepest needs. Only Him. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Only Jesus can. Jesus, what do you want? I, at 10 years old, sitting in Catholic grade school, a scripture, the priest gave us a scripture, and I've been, and it changed me. It changed me. He put up Matthew 7, 13, and 14, and this is when I asked him, do more people go to heaven or hell? And he put this up. He said, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad. Its gate is wide for many that choose, choose that way. But the gateway to life is narrow and the road's difficult and only a few are going to find it. And I remember hearing him say that at 10 years old and I just sat in my chair sunk thinking, what? If you were to ask every Christian in America today, that's 8 out of 10 people by the way, they would say, I'm on the road. I, I, I'm on the path that leads to life. I know it. I know what I'm doing with my time. I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. Do you? Because according to this, Jesus has few. So how? I want that narrow path. I want that narrow road. Jesus, how do I do it? He says, all you need to do is believe in me. Believe in the Son of God. Is he sinless? Is he spotless? Is he Jesus' son that lived a perfect life? When you believe in that, and then you believe he died to take away all of your sins and all of your stuff and all of your crap. He took it all. And he died, and then he rose three days later and defeated sin, defeated death. And the Bible says when you call on his name and when you believe in him, you will be saved. That's what it says. That's what you do. But don't forget about repenting. He says you gotta repent. That means you gotta turn away. Kind of say no to things, right? Say no to the, the, the importance. Say, say, quit saying and to everything because there's things you're saying and to that aren't bringing you closer to Jesus. But make no mistake, when you call on the name of the Lord and you repent, you are blazing a narrow path that leads to life. And that's a beautiful day. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but some of you, you might be like me and Jake what were in California. We went there a couple months ago. We got to hang out with some church planters. And it was the first time we got to take our kids to see the ocean. Anybody ever been to the ocean? Anybody? Yeah, quite a few of you. Incredible, isn't it? How you can look at so much water and so much creation and think, God, you're big. Somebody once asked me about God being real, and I said, are you a creation? Is the ocean a creation? Is the tree a creation? He said, yeah. Well, if there's creation, there's got to be a creator. You can't have creation without a creator. That's impossible. There is a creator. And Jake and I were, we rented a body board, and, you know, drank about a gallon of salt water out there. It was awesome. It was great. And uh, Jake's like, that's pretty salty. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Don't drink a lot of that. Um, so we're out there, and we're, we're rolling around the waves, and it's fun. And Jody and uh, Ava were up on the beach, and we're having a great time. And all of a sudden, I look up, and I'm like, Jody left. I always knew she was him. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, uh, Jody left, and where's Ava? And I'm like, oh, my gosh, where'd they go? And all of a sudden, I realized we drifted. So all of a sudden, they weren't, they, they didn't move. We did. They were still where they always were, but they were way over there now. So I'm like, all right, we're going to trek back about a mile. But we drifted, and we had no idea. We had no idea. We didn't feel it. We didn't see it, but it happened. And I believe with all my heart this is what happens in our life. I don't think people drift from Jesus because they're just an evil person. There are some. But that's not the norm. That's not the vote. Most people are good people doing good things. But God's created you for greater things. And God says, maybe you've drifted. Maybe you're doing a lot of stuff that's busy and good, and you're like, I'm a good person. Well, honestly, you're not, and neither am I, compared to Jesus and compared to God's standard. That's why we need Jesus, because we're not good, and he's good, and he bridges this gap to God. It's so key, but have you drifted is my question. If you have today, you can get back on track. Like those connection cards, those mean everything to me. 
Because once this place is cleared out, people that write their commitments, I'm recommitting to Jesus. I'm committing to Jesus. I'm putting a prayer request in. I want to get baptized. Whatever it is, I'm like, yes, God's moving. God's moving in the hearts of his people. God's doing something. And God is doing something in you, and you know it. That's why he brought you here. Because he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And he's not giving up on you, and he never will. That's why he, it's, he loves you so much. He loves you so much. I don't know what the Lord is telling you today. I just know that he loves you. And he wants you to not drift anymore, but he wants you to walk back towards him and say, I want to start scheduling what I value most. And Jesus says, you know what? If you value him most, everything else seems to fall into order. All of a sudden, the worriness and the busyness, it's not there anymore. Not as much as it used to be. I want to pray for you, and then we're going to worship. God is so good. God loves you so much. God loves you so much. You're his creation. Don't ever forget that. And he doesn't just, he doesn't just say creation. He says masterpiece. I love that. Father, I want to thank you so much for what you're doing in your house this morning. God, I, I pray that everybody, that, that they're hearing from you, not from me, but from you, and that we're understanding that what we value determines what we do. And if we look at our schedule, do we value the things that are most important? The most important thing, you would say sitting at your feet. God, I pray that you give us the courage and the ability to sit at your feet, whether it's prayer, whether it's in your, in your house like we are doing right now, in your word with godly people. God, I pray that whatever you're telling people in your house to do right now, they'll do it. Whatever their next step is, it might be prayer right after the service. It might be filling out that connection card. It might be uh, talking to somebody, uh, saying hi. I don't know what it's going to be, God, but I know that you do. And our job is to do whatever you tell us to do. God, have your way. And if there's anybody, and I know that there are because there are everywhere, that have drifted from you, I pray that they blaze back to you swim back to you, crawl back to you, run back to you, and know that you are waiting with arms wide open. In Jesus' name I pray, and everybody says, amen. Hey, wherever you are, thanks so much for joining us today. We are so glad that you did. And if this blessed you in any way, man, we would love for you to subscribe to this channel, follow us on social media, and stay connected with us. And let me say most importantly, if you are ready to give your life to Christ or you want to make a decision for Jesus today, we would love it, man. Connect with us. Contact us at hello at meadows.church. Again, hello at meadows.church. Let us know what God is doing in your life. And know this, God loves you and the best is truly yet to come.